So I will have to wear these. That's, that's part of growing older, or as my wife would say, wiser. So, but the talk is on the relationship between climate change as we know it today and the rivers. And it's going to be in two parts. First will be rivers as we know them or as you see them out here. And then the last part, if we have time for it, rivers in a bit larger context. So to start with, a river. What's a river? So if you look at a definition, you've got it's part of the hydrologic cycle and cons uh, a natural flowing water course. You can add flows from the, the source to the mouth as was pointed out, the source high in the mountains to the mouth in another river, in a lake, ultimately into the ocean. Typically it has a channel, banks, floodplains may include lakes. They're just sluggish, deeper, slower moving parts of the river and generally moved by gravity. Okay, so we know what a river is. Now, how about climate? climate in the news and other places often misunderstood. Climate is the long-term average of weather. So all of the different things that you look at or hear when you read about the weather, the temperature, the wind direction, the how much sun you're getting, the elevation, the geographic features, and that sort of thing come together as weather items and over a long term, the long term average of these is the climate. And it's within that long term average that things that live in and around or near or even under the river have come to some sort of an equilibrium. The river behaves this way, they behave accordingly if things change they have to change. Now that's climate in the general sense. If you look at climate change, you have to look at two different ways or two different ways of looking at climate change. The very broad general view is since climate is a long-term average, if you get enough different things happening, that average is going to change. And has that uh, the climate change is not the cause of the variation. A lot of people confuse that and they think climate, this event was caused by climate change. Well, climate change is not a cause, it's a result. What does the causing is the change in some of those weather related features. Now, um, we might ask, okay, has the climate ever changed in the past? Sure, uh, Leslie could tell us about, you know, what the climate was way, way back in geologic time when the sun was way co colder than it is today and yet the oceans were still liquid. Something was different about the environment at that time that allowed the climate to be still providing for the liquid ocean. Uh, so we can look at it and say it definitely has changed in the past. It's been warmer at times in the past. It's been colder at times in the past. But one of the key issues here is how fast did it change? If it changes very, very slowly over millions of years, you get different species moving from one place to another where they're a little bit more accustomed. You get evolution, you get slow 
moving changes that the uh, animal species are able to keep up with. If it happens really rapidly, hmm, then you get mass extinctions if it happens rapidly enough because extinctions or mass extinctions, if they're more severe enough and widespread enough, because the biota or the animals, plants, cannot keep up with that change. And instead of being able to move, they can't. Instead of being able to migrate, they can't. And they get into conditions they're not able to cope with and they die. Now, what are some of the potential causes of this broad kind of climate change? Biologic, if you think, hmm, what's a big biologic process that could cause climate change? If we look over at Sparwood, they have huge coal mines. At the time when these coal beds were being laid down, they were sucking an enormous amount of carbon out of the atmosphere and depositing it in the rocks. Well, that had an effect on the climate at the time. So generally, if you remove carbon dioxide from the air in huge quantities like that, it tends to cool the, the climate. Or conversely, if you pump huge amounts of carbon dioxide into the air, it will raise the temperature. And if it raises it fast enough or lowers it fast enough, you have somewhat of an environmental crisis. If it's very slow, things can accommodate that. Variations in solar radiation. We've mentioned that the early, early atmosphere, the sun was 30 or 40% less hot or less efficient in heating us. So back then, you needed something to keep the earth warm. Uh, plate tectonics, moving plates around. If you have a plate that sits on the tropics and after a while it gets moved to the pole, something's changed. You'd better have your winter jacket on or you're not going to be able to adjust. So plate tectonics also can produce high mountains, low flat plains, and each one of those is a geographic, um, a different geographic setting than perhaps it was before, and it's going to create a different climate. Volcanic eruptions, little ones, not so much. They happen all the time. They last for a few, few years, and then they go away, and things can usually accommodate a change for a year or two or five or six years and things will come back to normal. But a really big one that is sufficient to change the chemistry of the ocean or the chemistry of the air that might last for hundreds or thousands of years, that would be a major impact on climate. Global warming, um, and I'll just leave it at that. The global warming would be a change in the, the level of greenhouse gases. And I won't define that right now. Most of you probably know already, but I'll come back to that in a little bit. Now, if we're looking at uh, climate change in a more specific or modern um, aspect, then we have to look at changes that are related to the, the modern day. So the first four of those that I, that I mentioned, the biologic processes, variations in solar radiation, plate tectonics, volcanic eruptions, they haven't changed a whole lot lately. They've been boringly similar, at least in, from our perspective, for quite some time. So climate change, as you read it in the newspaper or hear about it in arguments or like you're going to hear in the rest of the talk, relates more to global warming as changes in the levels of greenhouse gases in large part produced by human activity. So the key is, and now human activity 
is adding a lot to these greenhouse gases. But the greenhouse gases that are produced by uh, man or anthropogenic greenhouse gases, it's superimposed on top of those greenhouse gases that already existed. Now, those greenhouse gases lead to more heat retention and this heat retention is commonly given the name global warming. Global warming and climate change are sometimes used interchangeably, but really global warming is the cause, climate change is the result. So they're not interchangeable completely. So greenhouse gases, they've been around for a long time. This is, you know, the, not the man-made ones. And in a way, it's very good that they've existed. Like <coughs> the early sun, when it was much less bright than it is now, the only way that it could keep liquid oceans was to have an atmosphere loaded with greenhouse gases like methane and carbon dioxide that caused a huge increase or retention of that heat to the point that we could maintain liquid oceans. Pretty good. Okay, or there were times when for some reason uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases, mostly at that time greenhouse uh, CO2, were removed from the atmosphere to the point that some theorized that the entire Earth became very nearly one big snowball, almost totally frozen. Now, at the present time, if you were to take the, um, the let's say the pre-industrial level of greenhouse gases, they are keeping us warm to the point that if it weren't for those background greenhouse gases, the temperature, average temperature on Earth would be something like minus 18 degrees centigrade. That's the average temperature over the whole Earth. With them, we're at a more comfortable plus 15 degrees centigrade. And that sounds pretty good. It's nice to have that 280 to 300 parts per million greenhouse gases keeping us warm. Now, most of that was CO2. But if you think of one of the, oh, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Now, the greenhouse gases, they can be catastrophically too high. Like we mentioned, you could cause mass extinctions because things are just too warm. Or they can be too low and you end up with a glacial period. Or it's not to say that things like the Mal Milankovitch cycle are not related but it brings the temperature down low enough that the Milankovitch cycle can provoke glacial periods. So without dwelling on it too much, what are some of the main greenhouse gases? What's the main one you can think of? Water, water vapor. Water vapor is probably the most important one, but doesn't last long in the atmosphere. If you pump the atmosphere full of water, what happens the next day? It rains and it washes it out. After that, you're right, carbon dioxide, methane, and these both have a significantly longer um, time that they spend in the atmosphere before they're removed on the order of, of tens to hundreds of years. Or you can get things like uh, CFCs, chlorinated, uh, floral uh, hydrocarbons, or car uh, CFCs, I forget what the exact term is. Uh, O3, yeah, ozone, surface ozone, and nitrous oxides. And all of those have a longer period of time in the atmosphere, so they don't get washed out in the next rain. They have a significant long-term effect. And these come principally from burning fossil fuels, cement manufacture, farming activities, fossil fuel extraction industry, 
means leaky pipes and things like that. And more recently, as a secondary effect, because the atmosphere is getting warmer, well, now that warming is starting to melt the permafrost. And it's also melting or heating up areas in the shallow Arctic Ocean that have methane clathrates in them, which is basically uh, methane surrounded by ice. It's the ice that burns, if you've ever seen pictures of it. And <coughs> both of those, as they break down, release or have the potential to release huge amounts of methane into the atmosphere, kind of like a leaky gas pipe would or a leaky transmission pipeline. Now, after all that, let's take a look at the relationship of this climate change and climate change in the sense of caused by man-made additions of these additional greenhouse gases to rivers. If we look at a river, the state of the river is basically how it behaves over one whole year. I mean, the river today is not like the river six months ago or six months from now. We have to look on it as a yearly cycle. And it's superimposed on the geography of a particular area. Ours happens to be low, rolling, mountainous. Other areas are flat, open plains. Some are near the ocean. Some are inland. But we'll, we'll try to keep it more related to what we have here. In the Kootenays, then, what do we have? We have snowy winters, relatively warm, dry summers. And it would be different if we were at some other place closer to the ocean, further south, different country. And then if we look at the, the weather conditions that um, are most important, we end up with temperature and precipitation. Precipitation is related to temperature, as we'll see, but temperature is also involved in the wind direction. It's involved in how much sunlight we get. It's involved in the cloudiness. If, if you take a look at all the different things that the weatherman measures, almost all of them have a relationship to temperature. So we'll talk about those two things, but we'll take precipitation first. So for us, precipitation is largely determined by movement of air masses over geographic features like mountains. <coughs> In our area, this would be a typical example. We start with the ocean and you get evaporation. That the winds that generally blow from west to east move that air up and over top of the mountains. As they rise, the air cools, and since cooler air cannot hold as much moisture, you get precipitation. So it starts out as rain, more rain. You get up where it gets cold enough, snow, more snow. Then it goes over the top, down the other side. But on the other side, it's warming as it falls, and you get evaporation. If you go on the east side of major mountain ranges in this area, they tend to be drier than <coughs> the, the windward side. And it might go down if there's a river or a reservoir at the bottom, get a little bit more evaporation, and then it repeats itself going over the next peak and the next one and the next one until you're all the way through the Rockies and then you're into the plains. But <coughs> this would be the general pattern of, of precipitation in this area. You get the snow line, and that would be the level in the winter above which you get snow accumulating, and below which it, stay, it comes mostly as, as rain. Now, if we take a look at that precipitation, how is this going to look on a graph? Well, you'll see this graph several times. It doesn't have a lot of numbers or anything like that. 
all it's got January, December, and everything in between. So one year. So let's take and we'll put what happens in one year on this graph. Oh, there's a snowstorm, another snowstorm, last big one. In the summer, now we're talking rainstorms, maybe occasional summer rain, a little bit more, and then we're back up to here again. That represents weather. That's what happened every single day at that particular place, geographic location. That represents the weather. So just one point as far as precipitation is concerned. Okay, let's put another year on top of that. The peaks are different. More weather. Put some more on there. Now, if I get 30 or 40 years of weather, or 100 years of weather, and I average that, I get I get climate. So climate is the average of weather. I take all that extraneous stuff out and I have the climate of this area as far as precipitation is concerned. That's generally what it's going to be. One day a little more, one day a little less, but if I get more one year, I'll get less the next year or the next two or three years. And the biota and everything can adjust to that amount of water coming down or precipitation in the winter, in the summer, and on into the next winter. So now we've got climate as a precipita uh, for precipitation. Now, if we get global warming or climate change as it is coming along and we're getting warming if we go back to this diagram, we're getting more evaporation, more water being pushed up into the atmosphere, either more rain or more snow, <coughs> but not everywhere. Places that are used to getting a lot of rain and snow will probably continue to get lots, maybe even more. Places that are used to being dry it may not change that much. And in some cases, because air patterns change, uh, things will be a little bit different. But as far as we're concerned, we might get something, and this is just a guess, like that. So that would be our climate with climate change. We just raised the bar a little bit in most places. It didn't seem to affect us much in the summer. Now, oops, if I skip a page, I'm in trouble. Now, this is precipitation, but let's change this to what really affects the rivers, and that is how does the river behave? We want to look at runoff. And if we take a look at runoff, now we have our same diagram. We have our same endpoints on there. What's the runoff look like around here? In a typical year, it might start here. and have something like that. Well, you might think, why isn't the runoff the same as the precipitation? Well, the main reason, a lot of this comes as snow, and it gets stuck 
up on top of the mountains and stays there, just stored until springtime. Then in springtime, you get spring runoff where a lot of rain comes, or a lot of water comes down very quickly, drops off in the summer, little peak in the fall. <coughs> That's about this time of year when you might get fall rains just before things freeze up and you start accumulating snow again. So precipit or the runoff is the most important thing as far as the rivers are concerned. Now, how are they going to be affected by uh, climate change? Well, first of all, we noted we have more precipitation to deal with and the temperature is warmer. So the tendency is to have heading to the boys room. <laughs> we'll put that on in a different color if we can. You have a higher peak a little bit earlier and then So the change is we have a higher peak, meaning the runoff in springtime could be more intense. It'll be a little earlier, maybe a week or two earlier. Uh, and it's at a time when organisms are not necessarily ready for the peak flow to occur. <coughs> Some organisms could suffer because this, when you raise the, the runoff or the power of the stream, you increase tremendously its ability to carry sediment. So not only is it going to be dirty with, with lots of uh, um, silt in it, like it would be normally in the springtime, but they'll have a lot more silt. And that silt could later on end up choking certain parts of the river system. But it's also going to be able to move particles that are much bigger, big boulders and things like that. This period here is when most of the erosion takes place in the river system. So you could have tremendous more amount of erosion in that period. And then take a look what happens later on. There's a greater distance between your spring peak and this little fall peak. And especially for smaller streams, they may actually dry out. If they dry out, that's pretty tough for the things that live in the, in the water. But, and that would be partly a result of the fact that, again, the climate has changed. It's become warmer and you've had a greater amount of time for evaporation to take place. Uh, we're not dealing with the amount of other kinds of extraction, like for domestic use for water or anything like that. We're just talking about uh, a more or less natural system. But even then, the level of water in the summer could actually become less. We normally, we have a little ditch that runs past our, our house and normally, we have water in that, everything except two weeks in August, and then it starts to flow again. This year, it stopped at uh, nearly the end of July, and it still doesn't have any water in it. Now, that's, that's one example that certainly doesn't uh, mean that climate change or anything is a result, that that's a result of it, but that's the sort of thing that you might be looking forward to in the future. <clears throat> Another reason is this snow that's up in the upper reaches up here. For us, uh, a lot of people come here because Kootenai powder. It's really good icy cold crystalline snow. And it takes a lot of energy to take Kootenai powder, raise it, to the point where it's kind of sloppy spring snow 
and then finally melt it. As time goes on, the tendency is going to have, be to have more snow there, but it's going to be of lower quality. It'll be more of what they call elephant's knot. So that really sloppy, wet snow that if you breathe on it, it's going to melt. It's very, uh, it doesn't take much energy to cause it to melt. So an elevation in temperature could cause this to melt earlier in the, in the year than if it had to melt really high quality Kootenai champagne powder. So this would be the outcome of what you would be looking for in this area in the future. Now, the effects we've seen, the higher peak, and I've got a bunch of equal signs bet between these because they relate right down the line. Higher peak, more severe flooding. flooding. This more severe flooding is going to give you a new definition of your 100-year flood because the 100-year flood was based on this climate. Now we've changed. So you might hear people say, gee, we've had a 100-year flood five years ago, and we've had another 100-year flood. We're in a different paradigm. We're in a different system where the 100-year flood now has to be based on this new peak. And it's going to take a much stronger flood to be a 100-year flood in this, in this new system. That's going to give you greater erosion, partly because that time of the year, there's no plants yet. The ground is saturated. Things are relatively uh, gooey, you might say. It's easier for a much stronger flood like that to rip things up. So you get greater erosion. If you get floods, it's going to wash in all that accumulated uh, material from the floodplains, which might include pollution, but it might, you know, uh, and if it's great enough, it might even overrun the local, um, no, the, the local um, sewage systems, you know, where you have sewage lagoons. They're generally protected, but in a high flood year, there's not a whole lot of difference between the, the river level and maybe some sewage lagoons in some areas. If it gets high enough, they get swept in. Then you have not only pollution, but a lot of organic material. And certain things like algae love the organic material. You'll get algae or algal blooms either in the streams or more likely in the lakes. And they use up a lot of the dissolved oxygen. And you may later on in the year get dead zones, areas where you simply cannot raise anything or nothing can live because the oxygen has been stripped out. And you might say, well, wait a minute, we've got this whole series of dams up here that are gonna be, they've been touted as flood control. Won't that take care of this extra flood? And you might say, well, in the major rivers, yes, until they're full. But once the dam is full, it no longer serves as flood control in any way or shape at all because water comes in, it has to go out, or it's going to go over the top and go out anyway. So as long as these dams are not full, they serve as a bit of flood control. Once they're full, that's the end of it. And smaller rivers don't necessarily have these dams. So if you have floods like this on the smaller or tributary rivers, they're going to be in, ending up washing more sediment and debris into the bigger dams, reducing their capacity. Now, eventually, you might find this a little bit harder to, to take, but eventually this diagram and this diagram might coincide. You say, well, how could that be? Well, if I look at this diagram and as the temperature gets warmer, the snow line will go up and up a little more until 
<coughs> there's very little area that has snowpack in the winter because it will be coming down as rain higher and higher and higher. You'll have very small reservoir of snow and it will disappear very quickly and your runoff diagram will start to look like this one. You might say, hey, that's great. We got rid of that big peak, that summer peak or the spring runoff peak. But if you get a particular, if this was the runoff pattern and you get one storm, either a winter storm or more likely a late spring storm, there's still some snow on the ground and you get an extra peak in here, then you have the, the makings for a catastrophic flood. There's the rain coming down if it's heavy, melts the snow, and you could get what they call a rain on snow event, where not only do you have the rain, you have the melted snow, you have additional melting of, of snow. It's like that elephant's knot, it's, right, it's ready to melt. Condensation on that will cause it to melt very quickly, and you get torrents of, of water coming down a hillside with no vegetation. Then you have potentially things like de debris flows, avalanches, uh, that sort of thing. And in this area, you have had some instances of that in the past, usually more related to, to other activities than this, but it's something that you might have to look forward to. Now, these changes, as we have an increase in the um, climate change, you might end up with other things that affect the biota. We've already mentioned more silt in the water, silting up of gravels, like you might silt up um, salmon spawning streams and things like that as you get more and more silt being washed in. You might, with these stronger peaks, get more abrasion of the eggs that have been left in the gravel over the winter because the abrasion factor goes up tremendously as you have a higher and higher peak. It's warmer in the late summer, so you get, it's warmer, evaporation is higher, the flow is way down there anyway, certain streams will dry up. <coughs> or if they don't dry up, they'll get warmer. And a very warm stream is almost as deadly to certain species as the stream drying up completely. Certain fish can take that and other ones don't. So you may have a tendency to go from salmonoids or trout to what they consider junk fish. And you'll get other ones that can stand the warmer conditions but are not as tasty or it's a different species anyway. So the type of fish will change as will a lot of other things in the food chain. So other things in, in the food chain are, are affected just like the fish would be, and some will go, some will, will stay, other ones will proliferate. You get, as we mentioned, more pollution, algal blooms, lower amounts of oxygen in certain areas. Uh, one of the places where this lower oxygen is notable is if you go to a lake that's a little bit deeper, like Champion Lake. And you go to Champion Lake, you take a sample near the bottom, you bring it up, you open it up, and it reeks. Hydrogen sulfide, methane, carbon dioxide, it's got all those things in it. The bottom is toxic. The bottom, maybe the bottom 10 meters. So you're accumulating toxic gases in this bottom zone, it's a dead zone, the fish <coughs> are restricted to the, the top of that zone up to the surface, so the lake to them is nowhere near as deep as it, as, as it appears to be. So in that, you're going to have winners, you're going to have losers, but you'll definitely have change. And some of these changes we have no idea what they might end up being. It's, it's a bit of a guess, 
But as they say, time will tell. Now, let's look at temperature. If we take a look at temperature, that's the one that had its fingers in so many pies as far as the weather is concerned. It's in the equation for all, almost all of these other weather-related phenomena. And fortunately, it's one of the easiest things to measure. If you just hang out a thermometer or any other number of ways of measuring it, and you can measure the temperature. <coughs> and most easily related to the increase in greenhouse gases. So the greenhouse gases, typically carbon dioxide and methane, but also some of these more exotic ones that have a long period of time in the atmosphere relate to, climate, to a warming in the atmosphere. How much has it risen? Well, if you take the beginning of the industrial period, let's say about 18, mid 1800s on until now, it's gone up just about, on the world average, about one degree. And they have people saying, we've got to keep it below two degrees, this sort of thing. <coughs> but it's not evenly distributed. And if you live on the tropics, you don't notice it that much, although it does heat up the water in the tropical oceans. But in Canada, let's say from Canada to the Arctic, the far north, it has an uh, Arctic amplification, so you get an increase of, let's say, four to seven degrees centigrade. So that's getting pretty considerable. We get hit harder than areas in, in the tropics. Has this ever happened in geologic time? Sure. Uh, and again, if it's gradual, slight changes in the temperature going up or going down, things adjust, they move to accommodate. So if you have it very generally, again, it drives the distribution of species, evolution of species, all as well. If it happens more quickly, let's say in thousands or tens of thousands of years, then you end up driving certain things to extinction because they just can't accommodate themselves quickly enough. What's it doing right now? Well, uh, one degree in 300 years. That's basically from industrial time to the present. That's a bit faster. And the end of that curve, let's say the last few decades, it's been much faster than that. So we're looking at a very quick change in temperature. And it's that rate of change which people are worried about when they talk about, you know, the effect of climate change on most anything. So, <coughs> and it's that addition of those man-made greenhouse gases on the typical background that are causing this. The background, that's always there. That just keeps us from freezing too much in the winter and things. That's the good part. But when we add to it, at the rate we're adding to it, it creates a long-term effect that can be devastating. Now, we've seen the effect of temperature and precipitation. Other things <coughs> where temperature would affect the river. Oxygen is one of those odd things that as you raise the temperature, you drive out the oxygen. So as the temperature gets warmer, the water actually holds less oxygen. Even if you have a nice babbling stream, which is just beating all the air possible into it, it holds less oxygen than if it was cooler. Now, certain fish like our salmonoids and trout are very sensitive to the amount of oxygen in the water. And if you raise that temperature a little bit, drive out a little bit of oxygen, they can't make it. First of all, they get sick or they get stressed and they may hang on for a few years or a few decades, and then they get to the point where they cannot reproduce. And then that's it. They're essentially gone, and their place is taken by some other species of fish. And you can accentuate that, of course, if you go along and you strip off the edges of 
the riparian zone or you farm right up to the edge of the stream so that you don't have the natural shading over the river or stream that you had before. <coughs> if you can do anything to keep the water cooler, especially in the summer, that's, that's great. That's a really good long-term ac uh, activity. Now, you're also going to favor scavengers because there'll be more dead or dying things in the water. And these scavengers tend to use up oxygen as well. So they compound the problem by reducing the oxygen level even more. And of course, when you're melting things as the temperature gets higher, you may get to the point where you melt the snow fields or the glaciers that serve to feed the streams in the late summer and give them a little bit of flow. Once those snow fields and glaciers are gone, you don't have that uh, reservoir of, of water to call on and in, the, in the late summer <coughs> to keep the stream flowing. When they're gone, you might have, like the ditch next to our house, longer and longer periods when the stream is dry, either just a series of puddles or pools or completely dry. Now, just to change gears a little bit, that's kind of a sad scenario so far, <laughs> but I want to talk about other rivers. You might say, well, what other kinds of rivers are there? Well, if you take that definition of rivers very broadly, and we just say that part of the hydrologic cycle constituting a natural flowing watercourse. If we just take that, then we can include things like ocean currents and atmospheric wind patterns. Each one of these carries huge amounts of water from one place to another. It's under the effect of gravity because of just slight changes in the density uh, from one place to another. It doesn't have a fixed uh, bed or boundaries, but they can be roughly defined <coughs> by the edges of the currents or um, the, like the jet stream, things like that. And they redistribute a huge amount of, of water and energy, heat energy, from the tropics to the poles. Associated with that, is the idea where does the sun beat down the most, the, the strongest? Take, take a guess, where is this? This would be, let's say in a month, where is the strongest sunlight that you ever get? Any idea? Actually, just a few degrees off the South Pole in Antarctica in the summer, but equally near the North Pole in the Arctic in the summer when you have almost 24 hours of daylight and you have the sun is up at a higher angle, they get more sunlight than you do at the tropics. So if you combine these currents that are bringing heat from the tropics up north and the intense uh, solar radiation that they get in the summer, then you get this Arctic amplification you get short periods when lots of energy comes into the Arctic. And that's why you get a much stronger temperature um, effect there. <coughs> Some people have called the Arctic the canary in the coal mine of climate change because it changes more quickly and more severely than uh, the tropics or even in our area here we might notice a little bit of change. What they're noticing in the Arctic is a tremendous <coughs> decrease in the amount of uh, ice that covers the Arctic Ocean in the summer. It decreases on the order of 10 or 15 percent per decade. And it's done that for the last 30 or 40 years. So it's getting to a point where they're projecting another 20 years and there'll be periods in the summer when there'll be essentially no ice left in the Arctic Ocean. 
And you say, well, okay, better for cruise ships. You know, not quite. But what happens is most of that ice reflects the sunlight in the summer. It keeps an awful lot of it away. If you remove it, it gets absorbed by the dark ocean. The dark ocean warms and warms and warms and warms to the point that not as much ice is going to form the next year. And then it's more easily um, melted away again. And you get, instead of maintaining the Arctic as like it is now, any place you have ice, it's about a degree or two above freezing. doesn't matter when you go there or much colder in the winter. But in the summer, if the ice is gone, you've lost your air conditioner. And if you know what this is like, if you've ever walked along a trail in the springtime and there's a little slope with some snow patches on it, you're walking along and you feel these just cold breezes come down around you. Walk on the same path a month or two later when that snow is gone and you feel warm air coming down. <coughs> That's the effect of this air conditioner and it would be the same effect in the Arctic. Once that ice is gone, the summer temperature can go considerably higher. It won't stay at one or two degrees and it will make the next year snow harder to melt and it goes to the point that you might lose a lot of your snow and ice in the, in the summer. And if it happens long enough in the summer, it will stretch out and pretty soon you're melting parts of Greenland and you're melting parts of Antarctica. And then you have a real problem. If you melt it, you get sea level rise. Rise in sea level and you're endangering nations like Fiji, some of these islands that are only a few uh, meters above sea level. They're already making plans. Where do we, where do we go when uh, climate change removes our basically drowns out our city. Places like Bangladesh, millions and millions of people who live a few meters above sea level. <coughs> uh, almost happened in, in Miami and a few places like that this year with uh, the hurricanes, but it would just become much more uh, statistically, it would be easier for that to happen again than it is now. Sea level rises, the surface of the ocean gets warmer. Hurricanes may, may not be any more, but they may be stronger. Storm surge, things like that, become very th critical things for people living close to the edge of, of, uh, of the, the, the ocean, you know, on shore. What is, what if they, like, let's, let's say worst case scenario, like all the global things melt. Like okay, so if you, if you, uh, they have this on, um, the worst case scenario would be well off in the future because it's going to take a long time to melt Antarctica and Greenland. But what they're projecting right now is you could have a rise of anywhere from three to five, maybe three to 10 meters Whoa. by the end of 2100. Wow. So that's only, wow. you know, 80 years away. So that's a lot. Beyond that, it could go considerably higher than that. If you go back in geologic time, just to when the, let's say the last inter, interglacial, I forget what it is. It was like 20 meters higher than it is today. Something like that, 20 to 25 meters higher. So old shorelines are easily 20 to 25 meters higher than they are today. Well, that's where I don't know what percent of the world's population lives, but it's very, very significant, mm -hmm. the, the number of, of places that would be inundated. Wasn't uh, Greenland thawed in about 1,100 when the Vikings had uh, their farms there and everything? Yes, but the Greenland didn't thaw completely. It just it thawed to some degree. Uh -huh. And I mean, that was relatively minor compared to talking about the entire Greenland ice cap melting because it would be, you know, they, it warmed up enough that they could farm the areas around the edges. But uh, when you're talking about all of the ice cap melting, that's, that's, another, 
that's another story. Now, in addition to that, this is uh, just a final thing. <coughs> when you're talking about like the air streams, they're controlled more or less by the jet stream. And the jet stream normally will go around the top of the earth in a pattern like that. It's fairly it's sinuous, but not very much. And what's happening now is it's, it's becoming very sinuous. And these patterns in here tend to stick around for quite some time. It used to be we would have, if it rained today, it might rain tomorrow, and then it would be raining in Alberta the next day. Well, now it can rain here today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day, four or five days before that finally works its way out and takes off. And then it turns warm. And instead of staying warm for a week, it'll stay warm. Well, this summer would be kind of an example. It stayed warm all summer. It because there was a persistent high pressure system in um, the near the just south of the border that stayed there almost all summer long. So you get more intense weather and more persistent weather. And that just adds to the possibility of these severe flooding events at what we would consider unusual times during the year. So that's, that's another effect of, of the, the climate change. But again, it's not an effect of climate change. It's an effect of the global warming or increase in greenhouse gases that produces that. And it also produces your climate change. Now, in those last two rivers, who are the fish? We are the fish. Okay. In those rivers, they're global. So we are the fish and we're subject to similar problems. Displacement. We get moved from one area to another as one area goes into drought and someplace else. But we've got these inconvenient little things called political boundaries that that separate us. And that makes an added problem that we as fish would have to uh, uh, deal with. Dead zones. Well, we have these dead zones in deep bodies of water along the shores of oceans in the uh, Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico. They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Formerly very, pr formerly very productive areas. And now they don't produce much because there are certain areas are increasingly large dead zones. And partly because of increased flow of pollution, often excess farm fertilizers and things like that, producing algal blooms, destroy the oxygen, and you have a dead zone. Increased stress. Well, we become more stressed when there's more uh, political turmoil of people trying to cross borders but as well, and disease. You can have, there's certain times that you can't eat the shellfish or other things from the ocean. Those things just becomes more and more. Weakened economies, some economies are strong, some just can't take that much of, of a um, extra push before they become weakened. Decreased quality of life and you might say the possibility of local destruction. It wouldn't be that we would become extinct, but if you lived in some island in, in the Micronesia, you might. You might have to leave and go somewhere else. So, and then one that I haven't touched on at all is acidification of the ocean. All this extra CO2 in the air, some of it goes into the ocean, the, the pH drops, which means that the ocean becomes more acidic. And then it starts to affect um, 
the life cycle of certain things like s anything with the carbonate shell, like sea fish or seashells. And these things, there's a level in the ocean that below which calcium carbonate is just dissolved. Above that, calcium carbonate can exist. And that level is slowly rising. When it gets to the near the surface, we won't have shellfish for, for food. So it's going to be an increased stress in that sense as well. So a lot of the things that we see as a local problem in our local rivers actually affect us on a global um, level as well. And if we can deal with these or solve some of these on a local level, we might be able to extrapolate some of these to a, um, a larger world scene. Okay, thank you.